Good morning, Calvary. Baptism Sundays are the best, especially having the little ones in the room with us. It's so good to have the family together and to be able to celebrate that God is still transforming lives and that the power of the resurrection is still resurrecting people today. And to see all these names that have given their life to Christ and experienced the love of God in their life. It's just so wonderful to do that together. Now, what I'm thinking about doing in the next hour or so as I teach. <laughs> just kidding, if you're like visiting, you're like, how long is this service? No, just a few minutes. We're gonna be in the book of James, which we're studying. And James is primarily concerned with how we live as Christians. It's a very practical letter. It's not, not interested in being called a Christian. It's interested in how the people of God are Christians. And it speaks to very specific things in our life. And so even though we're going to be in James for a very short period of time this morning, um, it's, it's a sucker punch. It's going to hit you in the gut. It hits me in the gut. And so I just want you to know that uh, before we get going. But it is personal today. But it's also instructional and life-giving if we lean into it. So here's a situation that I have found myself in. I wonder if you have ever been in something like this. Well past midnight, and you've been arguing with your spouse for hours. And you're wondering, how did this argument begin? I mean, I, I remember we started by talking about a miscommunication or a lack of communication that I didn't give to my wife, Kristen. But it seems like now it's covered every area of our whole life. We've been talking about like dish towels and, and laundry and finances. And then we like brought each other's extended family in it. We've been talking about all sorts of things and how they're going to impact our kids hypothetically in the future. And you're wondering what happened? What started this? Why have we been arguing for hours? And, and really you're thinking, or at least I'm thinking, how does it end? Like, how, do, how does this stop? How do we stop arguing? And how do I go to bed? Because I'd really like to go to sleep. And so I started thinking, you know what I would do is I would just start apologizing for everything. So you're like, I'm so sorry that I didn't communicate to you about these things. I'm so sorry that I didn't put the, the towels away. I'm so sorry I'm breathing right now. I'm sorry I'm alive. You know, whatever. I'm just going to apologize. But you know what? It doesn't work because she's on to me. She's like, that's not a genuine apology. You're just saying sorry so you can go to sleep. And you're like, I'd say anything at this point if you let me go to sleep. But that's the question is, how did this argument blow up? Where did it come from? What was its cause? How does it end? And James is going to address that specific question. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to James chapter 4. Grab your journals. James chapter 4, verse 1. Those arguments aren't just for the marriage. Those happen amongst friends, amongst family members. They happen with coworkers, neighbors. James has been talking about how they can happen within the church, how these quarrels and fights can happen amongst the people of God. And he asks this rhetorical question, which he intends to answer. Chapter four, verse one, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? That's the question that James is asking to the, the recipients of this letter. What causes the arguments that you've been having. So I want you all to put an argument in your head. Take the last argument that you've had. Perhaps it was like 35 minutes ago on the way here. Maybe it was last night. Maybe you're in one. So I want you to think about the most recent argument that you had or are in right now. What has caused that quarrel and that argument? Now you're listening to this going, sound, 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 sound. It's not a what. It's a who. Like, let me tell you who is the source of these arguments because I'm not an angry person, but she, he makes me so, what would you say? Crazy, mad, angry. It's not a what, it's a who. And let me tell you who it is. It's these coworkers. I mean, I didn't get to choose my team. I'm on this team. They drive me bonkers. It's my neighbors. I mean, they bought this house and they're doing these things to it. They're driving me crazy. It's my kids. I mean, yeah, I, we, we birthed them, but I don't know whose kids they are. 
Like they make me so mad. It's all of these people. I mean, I didn't get to choose to have them and they make me an angry, quarrelsome person. And then there was this time in your life that you finally met someone and she didn't make you mad. He made you laugh. It was great for the first time ever. It's like, I didn't fight with someone. And so because they were such a wonderful person that you never fought with, you thought, gosh, I should marry them. And so you got married. And now that's the person you fight with the most. So what's the common denominator in all those relationships? Tell you what, grab your phone, pull your phone out and turn your camera on. I'm serious. Pull, pull this out. This will be like a date stamp. Grab your phone. Turn your camera on. Turn on the front-facing camera. You know how you do this. I mean, I've seen you guys on Instagram. Someone shows you like, it's like, hi, cheekbones looking good. Like, <laughs> and just take a picture of yourself. That's who it is. That's the person. That's the who is the what that's causing the quarrels and the fights. That's what James says. So we're just gonna read two more sentences. Just, just two more sentences that James unpacks this argument and just listen for all the times you show up in it. Just listen. Chapter four, second part of verse one. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Who's the what that's the source of all the quarrels and fights that you're in right now? It's just me. You kind of have to own it. This is where the mature Christian, who's not just interested in being called a Christian, is interested in being a Christian, has to look at the last quarrel and say, you know what the source of that was? Was me. The bottom line is this, and it's it's kind of an embarrassing bottom line. Here's the bottom line. What has caused that quarrel? I'm not getting what I want. That's James. There's all these things you want, these passions and desires. You're not getting them. In fact, other people have them, And so because you don't get what you want, you're fighting and quarreling. What is the source of all your quarrels? I'm not getting what I want. So think of that last quarrel that you're in. What did you want? I just wanted to be on time. That's it. I just just, just wanted to be on time. And so I'm screaming and I'm yelling because she's never on time. I I just want to stick to a budget. And I don't know why they can't stick to a budget. I just want him to make more money. I just want her to make more money. I just want him to be the spiritual leader. I look out in the the church and I see all these great men who are leading their families and are spiritually mature and he's not. And I want him to be. And I'm not getting what I want. I want her to stop being so selfish and think of others. I want her to control her words. I want, but I'm not getting Think about this with your kids even. You're sitting with your kids in the car and they're screaming and yelling and then you start swatting them in the back seat. Like, be quiet. Why are you so angry? Why are you fighting with your children? I just want the car to be quiet. I just want my kids to say thank you. I just want them to say I love you. I just want kids that they have. And so James is just unpacking the fact that our heart is filled with all sorts of desires and passions for what kind of mom we want that maybe we don't have, what kind of dad we want that somehow we don't have, what kind of marriage we want, what kind of family we want, what kind of church we want, what kind of pastor we want, what kind of sermons we want, and we don't get them. And James says, and that's what causes all of these fights and quarrels. Bottom line. I'm not getting what I want, and so I fight for it. 
And there's just, there just an honesty in our own lives. We just have to step up to and say, you know what? Maybe the thing we're fighting about isn't the thing that we're fighting about. But maybe the thing we're fighting about, and this is where it's, it's kind of embarrassing because you don't want to actually admit to the person you're fighting with what you actually want. Like there, there are husbands in this room that just fight with their wives because they, they, what they really want is just, I want more intimacy with my wife, but I'm not going to say that. And so I'm going to fight and yell about all these other things. And there are wives in this room that are screaming and yelling about certain things that he isn't this or that because what they want is someone maybe not to fix all their problems or someone to listen and pay attention and pursue. But he's not doing that. But I'm not going to say that. Like, I want you to pursue me. That seems so selfish. And James says, yeah, that's the point. That's the whole bottom line of this is we're all a bunch of selfish people with passions and desires. We're not getting what we want. And so we're, we're fighting and quarreling about it. And he points out in here, he says, what you want is like, what everyone else has. You, you covet. Coveting is you, you desire to possess what other people have. Like God hasn't given it to me. He gave it to you. And I'm mad you have it. And I don't. And James actually makes this point. He says, you fight and quarrel. You're jealous and you covet. You desire and you don't have. And you murder for it. Now, is that, is that hyperbole? I mean, he's writing to Christians, like people inside the church. Is it, is it really possible that Christians could want something so bad they'd kill each other for it? Or is this just hyperbole? Well, I think we should just start, what's the first story of the Bible? The first family of God is Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. And, and what does Cain do to his brother Abel? Like within the family, he kills him because he wants what he sees Abel has with God from his sacrifice. It's this self-focused, self-deceiving, jealous heart that he has. And so he kills over it. Think of King David. David wants this woman that's not his wife until he takes Bathsheba. And then what he wants is for the story to go away. I want, I want, what I want is to have made better decisions and I can't go in the past and make better decisions. And so what I want is to go back in the past, but I can't. And so now I'm going to try to hide it. What I want is to hide what I've done and he can't. He can't make it go away. So what does David do? He kills her husband. So is it just hyperbole that James has here? Or is it actually speaking to the immeasurable weight and seriousness of what's going in our hearts with uncontrolled passions and desires. I think it's a true outcome. I would say it this way. When we don't get what we think we should, we can do things we thought we couldn't or we think we shouldn't. When we don't get what we think we should, we can do things we know we shouldn't thought we couldn't. That's the power inside of us. Have you ever said this at the end of an argument? Like, man, I, I'm never going to yell that way again. I'm never going to use those words again. I'm never going to drink that again. I'm never going to look at that again. I'm never going to go there again. Never again. And then you find yourself saying it again, doing it again, going there again, looking again. Why? Well, because I'm not getting what I want. And when I don't get what I think I should, I'm capable of doing things I know I shouldn't. That's what James is saying. And so the mature believers say, okay, well, what do I do with these passion and desires that are at war within me? I mean, they're in here. What do I do with them? Well, that's where he turns to this conversation and says, well, you don't have because you don't ask God. Like, you don't have the satisfaction of some of these passions and desires is because you're trying to get them satisfied in all of these different sources in the world. You're not even asking God to be the source of your satisfaction. And so he says, well, the first thing you should do is turn to God. And some of us are in this room going, why would we turn to God with some of these passions? Well, because God's the God that desires to satisfy us. Did you know that? Like, if you don't know that about God, God is so good and he's so loving and he knows who you are. He knows the situation that you're in. His desire is for us to be satisfied. The psalmist, I think, captured this so well. This is Psalm 107. 
So he gives all these examples of people who end up getting in themselves into deep trouble because they were pursuing satisfaction in all sorts of sources in the world and they just ruined their lives. But from there, they turned to God. This is Psalm 107, verse four it says, some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Like they're looking for a city, a place that provides respite and security, rest, but there's no city, there's in the wilderness. They can't find one of their own. It says they're hungry and thirsty. That's good desires. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He answered their prayer. They turned to God and he said, all right, come here. I will deliver you out of where you're at. Check out verse seven. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. He brings them into a city. They're looking for a city. They can't find one. They're in the wilderness. They're miserable. They're dying. And they say, God, God, would you rescue us? He says, all right, I'll bring you into the, a city that your heart really desires. I'll give you that respite, security, and peace. And it says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Verse nine. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. That's who our God is, is the one who satisfies our true desires. And so we turn away from all the sources in the world trying to get these passions, turn away from all the things that other people have and say, Lord, would you be the one that brings me to the place of respite, of security and provision? You know me and what my heart is longing for. And I know it's your desire to actually satisfy my soul. That's what the psalmist is saying. So James says, okay, part of the problem is you've never turned to God to have these desires satisfied. Now, why wouldn't we turn to God to have these desires satisfied? You're like, well, I wouldn't ask God for the things that I want. Uh, they're not godly. That's true. That's true. It's convicting. I want things that I know that he doesn't want for me. And so I'm not going to ask him for it. But some of us will hear this and say, okay, I'm, God wants to satisfy my, desi my desires. Okay, I'll start asking him. And you're like, I asked him. I've asked him for years for all of this stuff. I've asked him for even good things in my marriage. I've even asked him for good things in my career, good things in my community. And I've given him my Christmas list. And it's not satisfied. Which is James' next point. He says, when you ask, you ask wrongly. You're like, oh man, there was a right way to ask? Oh gosh, I didn't know it was like rub the genie twice. That's not what, that's what he's saying. It's like, you come to God thinking that there's a certain mechanism to ask him to get what you want. Who's the centerpiece of your prayer life still? Is me. Where are my affections lying in this prayer life? With me and my passions and my desires. Are you even thinking about God with this kind of prayer life? No. Does this person come to God and say, your will be done in my life, in my marriage, in my family, in my church, as it's done in heaven? Lord, I want you to satisfy your desires through me. Is that what this person's asking for? No, they're asking for God's stuff to keep spending it on them. That's what James says here. It says, you do not have because you do not ask and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. James uses this word to spend it, spending it, the same way that Jesus used the word spend it when he told the story of the prodigal son who turned to his father and was like, dad, I wish you would hurry up and die because when you're dead, I can have your stuff. I get an inheritance. And the father says, you know what? I'll give you my inheritance now. Here's the stuff. And then the prodigal goes and takes everything that the father had given him to spend it, same, same use of the word, spend it on himself and all of his passions. And does it satisfy the young man? No, he's miserable. He's miserable. He has the same passions and desires that he was hoping this would satisfy and he's not satisfied. And so he says, I will turn back to my father's house. I'll go home. I'll be like a servant because it's better to be a servant in my father's house than to be in this mess that I've made. 
spending my father's resources on my own passions. That's what James is saying is, why would God wanna give you stuff that won't satisfy you and only separate you from him? Like our prayer life is like, God, give me all this stuff. Give me what I think, what I really want. And he says, Thomas, if I gave you that, if I gave you what I had given to them, that's just gonna continue to separate you from me. You'll forget about me. You'll leave me. And then you'll be more rotten and miserable than you possibly could have imagined in the first place. And so knowing what James teaches us, what starts quarrels and fights amongst us? Is it not this, that you don't get what you want? And we're all kind of embarrassed going, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. I maybe need some help identifying what I really want, but that's about it. Is I'm not getting what I want out of her. I'm not getting what I want out of him. I'm not getting what I want out of them. It's desires and passions of my own body. And I haven't even turned to the Lord in this. And so James is just inviting his church, inviting his hearers to say this, you need to start owning your piece of the pie. You need to start owning your part of the quarrel, of the fight and the argument. It's not just them. It's not that they make you mad. It's that I'm participating in it. And so maybe in the next fight, maybe the one you're in right now, maybe this is how you actually start the car ride home, is you start by saying this, you know what has caused this fight? Is I'm not getting what I want. I know it sounds like a two-year-old. <laughs> you say, I'm not getting what I want. And, and this is what I want. And now that we've identified what I want, can we pray together and ask that the Lord would take all of these ones? I don't even know if these are good ones. I don't even know if these are the ones he has for me, but I'm gonna take all of the passions and all the desires in me and I'm gonna say, Lord, these are my passions and my desires. And I don't want you just to give me the resources so that these passions are satisfied. I want you, I want you to satisfy what these passions are really craving in me. Would you be the source? I'm praying thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. And so for the mature believer in the room, we say, the quarrel that we're in, we're just gonna own it. We're not gonna push blame anymore, and blame them. The blame game's over. We're just gonna own the quarrels and fights and it starts with me. And what is it that I really want? And then I'm gonna turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I know who you are, the one who desires to bring us into your city, into your relationship and satisfy the hunger and thirst that I truly have in my soul. As Augustine said, right? Our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. And so Lord, I'm asking for that rest in my own soul. Would you satisfy me? That's what the mature Christian James is calling us to do. So there's no more music. We're gonna end the service right here. And so what I'd like to do is let's just all stand. You can put your kind of stuff together. Let's all stand. And this is what I would like to surrender to Jesus today. Let's surrender to Jesus our next fight. How's that sound? Why don't we just surrender to Jesus the next fight we're gonna be in? And with the teachings that he has for us from James, maybe they inform a different outcome. And so Father, I pray for the women and men in this room. I pray that you would give them insights to what their heart is longing for and desiring. May they be mature men and women of God to confess to you and perhaps the person that they're quarreling with, what is it that they really want and they're not getting? And then Lord, in humility, may they take their passions and their desires and bring them before the good and gracious, compassionate God, by the name of Jesus Christ, that we would have these satisfied in him. And so Lord, we just surrender our next quarrel with a neighbor, with a friend, with a roommate, with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, whoever it's with. And we ask that you would take them and actually change the outcome that we've so often experienced. And may it happen in such a way that the name of Jesus 
becomes more famous and glory goes to the Father in heaven. It's in his name we pray, amen.